So, plenary three on disruptive technologies and economic regulations. Uh, I would request everybody to please be seated so that we can start on time. Uh, for this plenary, we have uh, Ms. Isabel Durant, Deputy Secretary General, Angtad in the chair. Uh, other discussants are uh, Mr. Barak Orbich, a professor, University of Arizona, James C. Rogers College of Law. Mr. James Mancini, Analyst, Competition Division, OECD. Uh, Cassie Lee, Senior Fellow, uh, ICS Yoshif Ishak Institute. Uh, can I also request Dr. Ajay Shah, Professor, National Institute of Public Finance and Policy to come on the dais. And Ms. Seema Gaur, Senior Economic Advisor, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India. Madam Gaur, can you please come on stage? In addition to these discussions, we are having two paper presenters. Uh, Mr. Dr. V. Shridhar, Professor, International Institute of Information Technology, Bangalore. And uh, Mr. Derek Ireland, Policy Consult Consultant, Carleton University. Uh, uh, just to, uh, as a precursor to this uh, session, uh, we had, uh, uh, had a very interesting uh, uh, opening session uh, yesterday, wherein thoughts were also shared about uh, regulating emerging issues and emerging technology, including how would uh, data uh, how would data be regulated and how would disruptive technologies such as multi-sided pr platforms be regulated. Are, uh, do institutional capacities exist to regulate such platforms and what should be the way ahead uh, uh, for ensuring optimal regulation of disruptive technologies. With this background, I would request uh, uh, Dr. Duran to take it over. We have a strict time frame for this session. Uh, uh, this session will run for a for 90 minute period and uh, my colleague would help you to manage the session. We have a red flag system as all of us are aware now. Thank you so much and okay. take it forward. Thank you for this uh, helpful support. So uh, first of all, uh, before to start, I wanted to uh, uh, make some opening remarks uh, on this, uh, this issue because I think that the issue of this uh, uh, session, uh, it's not the easier topic, uh, but probably it's one of the more significant uh, for the, further, uh, the, the future of economy because of the disruptive character of all those new technologies, first remarks. Second remarks, I think that it's a leitmotif since yesterday, there is or there is not uh, a big difference between LDC and developed countries. Well, I think that it's both uh, because, of course, it was said yesterday and in other panels that, of course, it's not the same situation in LDC countries because infrastructure, because low level of ICT literacy, etc. But there is a paradox because uh, there is also a capacity for people in LDC countries with those technology to have access to some activities absolutely not uh, 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 foreseeable before the generalization of uh, uh, this economy of platform. And you have also in developed countries many problems, uh, what we, we call uberization. Uberization, it means all the problems with taxation, with the new economy of platform. That's a problem for uh, in Europe, in USA, and uh, in developed countries. How do we manage that? Uh, how do we regulate it? Uh, and how we organize taxation uh, for people working in a very new sector or traditional sector, but with a very different way to work. So that's a, a second question. A, th a, th a third question uh, is the question of algorithm. And that's, of course, an important question. Could regulation uh, address the algorithm collusion, collusion? What about, for example, the price fixing? When a price is fixed by only algorithm, that's changed a little bit the, the way to work. What about the market uh, and the market online? Is it or not a problem for some countries when the price is fixed and monitor uh, on this way, as it was the case in the sometimes in the lobby of an hotel between two uh, two men discussing the price? It's very different today. It's permanent changing 
uh, and with, with this algorithm uh, approach. And the last question, uh, I think that uh, some of the speakers will speak about a way to regulate or try to regulate the sector, and, and they will speak about more cooperative and polycentric approach in the regulation. Of course, we could agree on that, uh, uh, everybody in this room. But of course, technology, application, etc., uh, it's, it's asked and it requests skills, competencies, and capacity to discuss that. And I say it very frankly, so I said yesterday I was minister uh, in my country, it's very difficult for a minister or for the civil society or for the citizens well, not so well uh, trained in technology to be part of this uh, cooperative or polycentric approach. So it means that it, will, it could stay in the hand of only technical, technological people and that's also a kind of, pro it could be a problem if you base your regulation only on this uh, uh, cooperative approach without people able uh, uh, to, 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 to be part of the discussion because of the lack of uh, competence or specific skills. So um, I, that's, that was four questions in order to start and directly I give you the floor to the first uh, speaker. He received uh, 10 minutes, if, I, uh, uh, if it's good. Yes, uh, 10 minutes for each. And so I give the floor to uh, Mr. Schridar. Thank you, uh, good afternoon, uh, thanks to Katz for inviting me to this uh, particular workshop. Uh, so the, the, the topic of my discussion is regulatory aspects of two-sided markets. Uh, you know, as the chair has pointed out, uh, digitization has leveled the playing field. You know, for example, um, Yeah, so the digitization is level, uh, you know, uh, really created a level playing field between uh, countries. You know, for example, today we have about six to seven unicorns that is, uh, you know, billion dollar or more valuation from India. And uh, Bangalore is listed uh, as uh, number 15 in the tech ecosystems in the world. So in that context, I would like to um, sort of... Uh, 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 note down specific aspects with respect to two-sided markets because if most of the startups that you see in the world today including Airbnb or Amazon or uh, uh, Uber they are all uh, belonging to this particular category of two-sided market platforms. So uh, the important characteristics of these two-sided market platforms have regulatory connotations. You know, for example, uh, these uh, two-sided market platforms uh, brings, bring uh, you know, two sets of users together. Uh, the users are listed here as you can see, uh, for example, the um, cab seekers and cab drivers in the case of uh, Uber and uh, uh, sellers and buyers in the case of uh, Amazon and so on and so on. Now the important uh, uh, aspect of these two-sided platforms is the network effect. The network effect is not only within the user set but also across the user set which is classically referred to as the cross-site network effect propounded by LaFont and Tyrol way back in 2004, and a classic paper was written by Eisenman in Harvard uh, Business Review. So this cross-site network effect has very important connotations because uh, these sets of users depend on each other, and as one set of user base increases, the other set of, the value for the other set of users increase, and therefore it, is a, it has a cyclical effect. And therefore, the value that uh, the users derive from using these two-sided platforms uh, almost grow exponentially. So um, this has a lot of important connotations. Uh, before that, I just want to um, brief a taxonomy uh, of the two-sided markets. The two-sided markets can be very slim at the top, such as, for example, directory services, such as Truecaller or Just Dial in the case of India. It can be aggregated platforms which enable the two sets of users to come on board, such as, for example, Ola, Uber, or Airbnb. Or it can be e-marketplaces, which uh, might sell the products, but they will also be involved in non-digital um, uh, activities, such as delivery and so on. For example, Amazon or Flipkart belong to this particular category. And we, um, you know, really uh, think that it has economic value because the most important aspect of these two-sided market platforms, any of these categories, is bringing down as information asymmetry. There's a huge information asymmetry between the set of users, and using digital platforms, they reduce that, and thereby, 
providing economic value, uh, increased consumer surplus, and possibly also increased producer surplus uh, who are on board of the two-sided market platforms. However, what has not been addressed significantly is the question of liability, disintermediation, regulatory arbitrage, and search cost. You know, for example, if you look at these platforms, um, the liability of the e-marketplace is very high compared to, for example, a directory service which provides just information. In the case of disintermediation, directory services provide much more disintermediation effect compared to, for example, e-marketplaces. Regulatory arbit arbitrage for e-marketplaces is very high because they have different business models, they have, uh, you know, they operate, uh, can potentially operate across state or even geographical boundaries and therefore uh, there can be a huge, uh, you know, regulatory arbitrage that these e-marketplaces face compared to, for example, directory services. Directory services provide a huge amount of, uh, you know, reduce the search cost, bring down information asymmetry quite a bit compared to, for example, e-marketplaces. So these are some of the characteristics of these two-sided marketplaces which will have regulatory connotations. The important aspect is typically the two-sided marketplaces are not monopolies or near monopolies. However, competition is minimal and that has been propounded by Eisenman, has been found to true in most of the cases and therefore regulation has a play to, uh, you know, uh, place to play. Multi-homing is typical. The users need not just home on to one platform, but they can home on to multiple platforms at the same time. How do we deal with this? Typically, platform differentiation is minimal because it's a commoditized service. Anybody can imitate. The imitation effect is very high and therefore, in general, the platforms tend to be non-differentiated and therefore, it is necessary for any of the platforms to attain the critical mass for sustainability. Asymmetric pricing is very common. Uh, the pricing that is charged by the two-sided marketplaces can be asymmetric. One, can, one side need not pay. It's normally called a subsidy side. The other side normally pays. You know, for example, in the case of Uber, the um, you know driver, drivers pay and uh, the people who, who, who take drives do not uh, pay as the platform cha uh, charge. Uh, the last one is platforms reduce information asymmetry. And therefore, they collect a lot of user information and personalize the services. And therein lies the concerns of data privacy, data protection, and so on. So, uh, what are the regulatory questions? The regulatory questions are, um, we know that because uh, of the huge network effect which is required in order for these platforms to sustain themselves, uh, and the increasing economies of scale due to network effects, normally these platforms tend to do predatory pricing, right? And, uh, you know, at least in the initial stages in order to attain the critical mass. We call this as capital dumping, right? So, as we see, you know, we see money is being dumped in order to give discounts. And why are discounts given? Uh, that is to increase the critical mass so that they can be on the exponential growth phase. Now, is this, uh, what is the effect? The effect is reducing competition. Capital dumping is being used as, uh, you know, uh, predatory pricing to wipe out competition. So one of the regulatory responses could be to do time limiting of discounting. See, these are still evolving. We don't have a regulatory mechanism in place in order to, uh, for example, regulate these two-sided marketplace in any way. The second aspect is horizontal vertical integration. So as these tools, uh, the marketplaces become bigger, they can acquire even the users from either sides and therefore they can actually become uh, monopolies. And therefore, uh, there has to be a regulatory response in mergers and acquisitions. Uh, this is uh, more so in the case of digital platforms, which provide digital services. For example, a telco acquiring a media company, right, to provide its services is a classic example of vertical integration uh, in the digital marketplace. The third one is homing. Uh, what if a platform offers exclusive contact to sellers and uh, outbeat the competition? Because we know that the two sides of users are required, but it is possible that the platform might uh, have exclusive contracts in order to prevent multi-homing of one set of users, in which case it might reduce competition and therefore there has to be a regulatory response. What is the user lock-in? What is the switching cost? Uh, do we have to uh, prevent uh, such kind of uh, behavior in the, in the case of platforms? Then the use of information collected for unintended use because information asymmetry is the biggest problem and that these platforms are trying to solve. Uh, they collect a lot of data and therefore uh, they can use it for personalized services, but it can also be used for non-intended services. 
So in the absence of a true data protection act in our country, uh, there is, uh, has to be a regulatory response, uh, whether uh, you know, it can be a mandatory user consent or uh, user rights on the collected information. And these are all some things which we need to really worry about. Then uh, there is first mover advantage. Yeah, because uh, these platforms uh, tend to be first movers, they do platform envelopment and uh, they might uh, take a lead over the competitors. So we have to have regular regulatory response with respect to significant market power assessment. And the last thing is, uh, are, there, are these just technology platforms? Uh, do they disown any kind of responsibility and liability for the physical goods and services that are provi being provided over these platforms? Uh, this has to be again taken up uh, by the regulator. So um, there are a lot of regulatory guidance which we can propose. You know, for example, there can be mandatory compliance on the case of uh, platform providers. Uh, for example, cabs should be run on LPG, LPG. You know, that's a classic example in the case of Ola and Uber that the Delhi Supreme Court, uh, Delhi High Court has uh, given. Or food safety check to protect the health of foodies. You know, for example, in the case of food aggregators. So there can be mandatory compliance. Um, the other uh, market regulatory rules such as, um, you know, uh, fair regulation or FDI regulation or any of those things can be left um, uh, without any regulatory intervention for these platforms to prosper. Uh, the other totally different view is that should we have regulation or should we have self-regulatory organization with a government oversight in order to uh, look at uh, the uh, two-sided marketplaces. So that's uh, my presentation. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> so I invite Mr. Derek Island from the Carlton University to present also his, uh, his paper. And Pradeep for inviting me here. This is the third time I've had the opportunity to travel two-thirds of the way around the world to present a paper for cuts, and it's always a delight. Now, what, what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about a very big issue. I have 10 minutes, and I'm not going to go over, because this is v new territory for me. I'm one of the least techie economists you'll ever meet, and therefore, when I dis started discovering that we're moving into algorithmic consumers and robot sellers and algorithmic reg regulators. My first, my first inclination was to say, horror story sounds like Stanley Kubrick back in about 40 years ago where, where computers are gonna be driving us crazy. Now, let's make sure I'm hitting the right one here, up and down. This is okay, okay, okay. Anyway, main argument is, is that as we move forward in this area, it'll be a good idea, I think, we bring a behavioral lens to this. I've been doing a lot of work on behavioral economics and a regulatory competition consumer protection setting over the last 20 years. Secondly, that we're looking at not tame problems, problems where we can get together and solve the problem in a couple of hours, but wicked problems that will constantly mutate, constantly be changing, where information and evidence on regulatory harm may not be as straightforward and so on. The main argument I would be making based on work we've, I've been doing on wicked problems like climate change and, and, and financial market reform is we need a much more open regulatory process. Because when we move into wicked problems, expertise can only take you so far. The economics, legal expertise, technical expertise. The wisdom of the, of the crowd becomes all that much more important. And more importantly, it becomes more important because the crowd, the public, are gonna have to understand what these technologies are all, all about, why they generate benefits, why they may generate harm, and what might be done by them themselves as well as others to help to rectify the problem. The first thing that struck me when I started getting into this literature, which was only about a year ago, because in fact, most of the literature I was reading has been produced in the last three years, is there's a lot, lot of actors in the digital mar marketplace, and they're expanding daily. We have algorithmic consumers, which allow me to outsource my decision-making on financial services and a lot of other things that I don't like wasting my time on. Now, I used to do that with my wife, but now I can do it to a computer program. I think, that's, I think that might be great for my wife, as a matter of fact. Secondly, we now have algorithmic suppliers and robo-sellers. So you've got algorithmic consumers 
transacting with algorithmic suppliers, i.e. the producers and the retailers and so on that are out there. The government is now still getting, is starting to get into the game and some of the more recent documents suggest that that could be a very, very good thing. But, but algorithmic re regulators that can be either government run or maybe outsourced to uh, the private sector or maybe even operating privately by the private sector for, for profit uh, can be another source of in another set of sources that will be influencing not only the competitive game in markets in the future, but also the regulatory game. Other literature is talking about algorithmic educators, that our kids are learning about algorithms, coding, and so on from a very early stage. And I remember when I had a three-year-old granddaughter 17 years ago who, who knew how to operate the computer better than I could at that point in time. So I suspect they're very ready for that. There's another literature on how, plat how cooperatives can go digital. They're called platform cooperatives. And this could be a, a new source of competition in a variety of markets. I come from a country and some places in the country where, that, where cooperatives, cooperatives have been a very, very important and very, very effective in the farm sector, for example. The, then, of course, you've got the conventional company, companies using algorithms for a variety of reasons, one of them being that they are using algorithms to help them to comply with all the regula re regulations that they need to, uh, that they need to uh, uh, comply with. And my skeptical nature, having worked in a competition bureau for a while, is they might be using those algorithms to figure out how to avoid regulation, how to avoid competition, how not to be detected. But then I'm, perhaps I'm being too nasty. And then you've just got an expanding number of final consumers who are very happy to, as the previous two-sided platform pr uh, presentation mentioned to us, they were very happy to escape the regular regulated markets because they will go to platform markets, two-sided markets, and so on, where there may be free goods, where the prices are lower, and where they're not being put up with uh, some of the, some of the su service su suppliers who they're not happy with. Many of the problems are, are sort of like the same, the comment that somebody made earlier about uh, old wine, new bottles, and so on. Some of the problems are, look, look similar to what we had before, but take on a new set of issues when we're looking at the digital marketplace. Obviously, we're concerned about market concentration, expanding market power. And in this case, of course, you're looking at expanding market power from the point of view of product markets, information, technologies, and increasingly a concern about how these kinds of, kinds of algorithms can be influencing who we elect and who is in government and who is not in government in one way or another. There are major information asymmetries involved in these, in these, kinds, of, in these kinds of platforms. And that provides new opportunities for, uh, uh, for product differentiation, for improving products, but it also provides opportunities for collusion and, and a variety of forms of anti-competitive and anti-consumer conduct. There are important information barriers. I think this is a point that probably needs to be discussed here more, that because of a variety of reasons, a number of the players in the digital marketplace do not have to provide full information. It may be because of patents. It may be because of trade secrecy. And it also sometimes can be because they're operating in areas where certain government security concerns could be arising. Therefore, they're having, their, their information is being protected and is not being shared with regulators, with the public, and so on. The privacy concerns, of course, are major and have been talked about a great deal. There's also a literature on the undisclosed biases of operators and so on creeping into these algorithms and how they might be used. They can be poorly designed. Evidently, the Facebook folks were surprised that, they, that, that perhaps their, uh, their, their computer software was being used to influence an election. I think we can extend too much faith and confidence in these algorithms. There could, there's, I think, conflicting government roles and responsibilities and functions. On the one hand, they have to regulate. On the other hand, every government wants to be a world leader in, out, in, uh, in uh, market learning uh, uh, applications. So there's an awful lot of reasons for concern. In short, we're talking about a wicked set of, uh, set of problems which in my view require new approaches to innovation and new approaches to re regulation. And uh, th that's all kind of in front of you and I think we've already gone through an awful lot of this material already. Possible issues for discussions. 
I've, I've included in my uh, paper a, a lot of discussion on what wicked, wicked characteristics mean in the context of the digital marketplace, finding the right balance, and what the implications are for developing economies. And one of those is certainly, in my view, along the lines we've been talking about in a number of sessions, the developing economies may wish to be a little slower in responding in a regulatory a competition in IP fashion with this until it, all, until it gets worked out. I see nothing wrong with free riding on the efforts that the European Union and the Americans are making, and Canadians have been free riding on those efforts for a long time, and I would suggest that might be a good idea, because as pointed out by a number of people, sometimes the worst thing a regulator can do is establish an unnecessary regulation that, uh, that uh, proves to be a disbenefit to innovation in the future. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for those two presentations. Uh, you give us more questions as answer, but uh, maybe it would not be the case with the discutant, and they will have a proposal regarding uh, regulation and how we will work on that. So first of all, I will give the floor to Mr. Barack Orbach from the University of Arizona James A. Rogers College of Law. Okay, so Mr. Mr. Orbach, you have the solution and the answer to all the questions, I think. Uh, thanks, and uh, thank you. I really think I'm grateful for the organizers. It's my first time in India, so I'm really happy to be here, and I greatly enjoyed the conference. Uh, uh, I would like to make a few comments about uh, Professor Schiedel's paper uh, and uh, to tie to the general topic of uh, disruptive technologies. Uh, so I would like to make uh, five general observations. Uh, first, uh, what's the meaning of a disruptive technology? Second, the general context of disruptive technologies. Third, the potential need for regulation. Fourth, uh, performance measures, measurements. And fifth, uh, general comments about uh, the applications in uh, India. So the comments will be brief by the nature of the, considering the time limitations. So disruptive technologies, uh, this is a term that people uh, use a lot. And it actually doesn't have a universal meaning or it doesn't have any technical definition. So it is important to understand that when two, individu two individuals uh, use the term, it actually doesn't have, they don't necessarily mean the same thing and probably they don't, ne they don't have any meaning in mind. They just say something because they heard it before. So it is kind of a broad uh, term. But generally we're talking about, a, 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 generally we're talking about a technological change or significant technological change, and any change is disruptive. You know, when I go to a hotel and uh, the bed looks great and I get into the bed, uh, I'm disrupting the order in the bed. Uh, and the thing is, why, 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 we, why do we have the term? It's because change creates some discomfort, and that's why we are basically have this conference, or that's why there are so many uh, conferences about the pr presently the uh, resurrection of the term the disruptive technology because uh, we have a lot of disruptive technologies around. We have significant technological change and people are uncomfortable with that. So, but again, it's important to understand we just talk about considerable technological change. There's nothing unique in the term disruptive technology. So that's number one. The, so number two, the, uh, the general context of technological change we're basically in the midst of the, uh, an industrial revolution. Now, that's people don't for economy for economists. It's really important to define the industrial revolution, and it's really a lot of a measure of technical meaning. But it would be silly to think that we are not in the mid, in the midst of industrial revolution. For all purposes, we are in industrial revolution, and that's the general context of why we are in the we have so many disruptive technologies, and a. What Shida was talking was what one of the major contexts of the disruptive technologies, platforms. I think that we do not actually have any general specification of platforms. So I think that actually it's very, very tricky to specify or have any taxonomy of platforms. They change, they are still changing and forming, and that's a problem. A, that's one thing in the context of platforms. It's also important to recognize that we have other forms of changes in the economy. We're moving, for example, one of the key things, we're moving from uh, fossil uh, energy to more efficient forms of energy. Another thing, we have advanced materials, and, B, and, and another thing is 
in health we make a considerable progress, which is not necessarily good because people will live longer and will have more people and they'll consume a lot of things. Uh, but uh, one of the aspects that, in, especially in the context of platforms, is that we have new forms of, business, of firms, companies, uh, which is a new thing. In the first industrial revolution, firms emerged. Second industrial revolution, we had the new, f the new firms of the, or what is called the firms, the firms of the 20th century, which separated control and ownership. And now we have the new firms that, sh that are basically platforms. So platform, there's one type, one, when people say platform, they mean one thing, they mean organization of market. The other thing is they mean structure of companies, which is basically a, a, a new, a structure which we don't have an exact specification. One of the thing is gig, a, a gig companies. It's a very different thing. It's a very unique thing. So that's the that's the context. The third the third point that I wanted to the, the third point uh, the third the third point that I wanted to make was a a was the, the was the specific was the performance measurements. And, and we generally talk, people use the term consumer welfare in a misleading concept or social welfare. Uh, in antitrust, we do not have a term, we do not have, the antitrust methodology doesn't allow measurement of welfare. What it allows to do is to measure a surplus. Uh, in the con when we have changes in the economy, uh, uh, we have many things that are non-transparent. So, for example, uh, changes in some aspects of the price are not monetary. Uh, people, for example, right now, people don't pay. Peop there are many free. There are many free products for, and people pay with their information. Uh, so, when there, are, when there are such things, then there are many laws that are related, are called consumer rights or stuff like that. So this is one thing that is important to understand, and that's the nature of the regulation. So in the terms of regulation, one of the things that we see, we see one aspect, which would be the, econo the traditional economic regulation, which would be about surplus and other things. A, another type of regulation that we'll see, it's about the, nature, the new nature of the firm, and the other thing will, be, will have a lot of social regulation because of the general changes in the, in the, the, general changes in the economy. And the last point I wanted to make, and the last point I wanted to make is related to, it's related to India, which actually I know very little about India, but I could still make two, observa two observations. A, the specification of uh, the gear of the platforms uh, that you made in your paper is, I could even tell that it's relatively par partial because many gig companies, uh, global gig companies use a, a Indian gig uh, workers, uh, and they would continue doing so more efficiently. So I think that actually much of the inputs of India for the gig economy is connection to the global companies rather than operation, internal operation, and that will probably continue to grow. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that India is probably uh, is considered to be the, but the future is already the battleground of Alibaba and Amazon which uh, it's the only one because in, so far around the world uh, Alibaba and Amazon separated and did not compete. When, if to the extent and if Alibaba and Amazon would compete in India, they would crush any, put any possible company and that's quite significant. Uh, and this, so these were my comments. Okay, thank you for this. Um contribution and also this Indian uh, point of view. Uh, I give now the floor to Mr. Kasi Lay, uh, Senior Fellow on ISEAS, uh, Yusok Ishak Institute. Sorry. Thank you, Isabel. Um, uh, I, we are, I'm tasked to discuss Professor Sridhar's paper and I will do that and I'll then go beyond uh, discussing some of the issues that, that might be relevant. Uh, this issue of disruptive technology uh, and regulation is a very serious one. I, I come from Southeast Asia and uh, we have talked about, we have heard about examples of ride sharing, for example. 
If you uh, look at the regulatory response in the 10 ASEAN countries, for example, to the emergence of rights sharing in Southeast Asia, the response has been varied, right? You, if you look at Singapore, basically free entry uh, with gradual uh, uh, re-regulation uh, of, this, of this particular market. If you look at Indonesia, initially they said, uh, yes, come in. And then uh, they started imposing uh, price cap, is the latest one, which doesn't exist in, in other markets uh, in response to uh, price surge. You look at Thailand, uh, yeah, you can do it as long as you, do, you don't get caught. Right? So governments are really struggling with, with this one. So this is a timely, uh, timely uh, kind of topic. So Professor Srida uh, looks at uh, what are the issues relating to technological disruptions, uh, in particular focusing on the two-sided or multi-sided platform markets, and what are the regulatory challenges. Um, I find uh, his discussion is quite interesting because what he does is he maps out what are the different types of disruption and what are the policy guidance that, that you might have. Uh, there, are, but there are some challenges in terms of the policy response that are suggested. For example, predatory pricing. It's extremely difficult uh, to determine uh, to what extent predatory pricing is occurring. Take, for example, the, the Singaporean market. Indeed, there has been a lot of discounts and price war happening between Uber and Grab in the Singaporean market. And yet, uh, it's kind of difficult because to, to say it's predatory pricing, uh, because the strategies that companies are adopting is shifting week to week. And the strategies involve not only the pricing, but incentive systems they give to the drivers. And uh, the disadvantaged taxi sectors are also evolving. So part of this challenge in uh, crafting a regulatory response to technological disruption is you cannot predict what are the firm level responses that will come up. Last week, for example, I was shocked to discover there is a new service in Singapore where the, service, uh, the taxi company has decided enough is enough, we'll, we'll up our game. We introduce a new service. You can use an app to book a taxi any time for any duration and ride, take it to the road and, and use it to get customers. So imagine if you want to drive a taxi, provided you have all the license, you can log in the app. Okay, I'm free. I don't have any lectures from 5 to 7 today. I'll drive for two hours. Then you can actually book a taxi and be a taxi driver for two hours. Never. When the Grab share came to the market, Grab and Uber, never would you would imagine taxi changing their mode of operation. So this is part of the regulatory challenges in dealing with issues like predatory pricing. In terms of horizontal and vertical integration, merger control, this is another interesting. Um, part of the challenge, for example, with platform, is not so much as the ownership issue. It's information, right? I ran some computer sim. That's part of my hobby. I ran some computer simulations on how platform compete, and one of the scenario is that well, they don't merge, but they share information on how many cars do they mutually have, and how what's the demand in the particular area, and with that they can actually price like a monopolist essentially, right? So, so looking at regulation, looking at technological disruption like Uber and Grab, you need to rethink what are the regulatory variables that are relevant here. And in this particular case, information is, is very interesting. Um, regulators in the new economy, digital, have tremendous amount of difficulty in collecting information. They have no idea what's happening. So one of the regulatory challenge could be, uh, without being too invasive, how do you collect information? Uh, for example, in the case of Uber and Grab, I have suggested to regulators to do two things. For example, one is in Singapore, uh, operate each driver of Uber share, they have, to put, they have to register and put a sticker up front that said they are a ride-sharing car, right? Um, one of the ways to monitor is now to 
issue, I suggest maybe to do it, issue a new kind of sticker with, which emits signal. So as you travel through um, different places, a regulator can collect the demand and supply fluctuation within different areas. And then if they do a sampling of information, they can get a better sense of uh, the, the market developments uh, in this area. So I've seen the red flag. I have quite a number of points here. So I'll go to discussing some of the key points. One of the issues with technological disruption is the dynamic nature. Uh, and this changes, technology is always going to be changing. And by creative destruction or creative uh, disruption, regulators need to think about how to regulate when you are not certain of the outcome. Uh, one approach is to have a more evolutionary, adaptive way of, of, of uh, doing regulation in which you see the problem as a sequence of steps and then decide at each step what is, where is the red line. Uh, you know, cartel is no, but what is pers permissible and then allow the market to evolve and see how consumers are affected and how firms are, are changing uh, at the same time. So it's a kind of like, it's not necessarily saying that, uh, so lagging behind technological change, regulatory lagging, is not necessarily bad, bad because it's inevitable, right? More importantly, is because regulators, nor firms, nor regulators have the predictive power uh, of what will happen, it could be an optimal way of, of looking at it. Uh, regulators also need, like I say, to change how they think about. For example, final, I just give one example. In the traditional taxi market, we are always sort of fixed in terms of thinking about prices as fixed prices, calculated based on a normal rate of return, that's what you get. But when you look at uh, the uh, ride-sharing market, what we need to think about uh, distributions of pi um, prices and how they evolve over time, not only across time, but spatially, right? Uh, in terms of prices in CBD, housing area. And the algorithms that are used can affect behavior as much on both the sellers and the buyers. For example, uh, for exa for an Uber, for example, Uber drivers uh, do not know where the passengers are heading. That's the, the, the algorithm that's used. They know where, which passenger to pick up from where, but they have no idea. But for Grab, the drivers know where they're picking and where the destination is. That changes the incentive system of the driver, the supply system, so much so that drivers for Grab can choose, oh, I don't want to go there, it's too congested. But Uber drivers, they don't, right? So that changes. So those are the things that, 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 that that's my point about um, technological the uncertainty and adaptive reg regulation. Thank you so much for this interesting contribution. I do uh, give now the floor to Mr. S M Mrs. Sorry, Mrs. Semago. She's senior economist advisor and the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology in the government of uh, India. So I give you the floor. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Well, I wish I had the answers to all these complex questions raised in the two presentations, but honestly, I have none. All I have is are some observations on Professor Shridhar's uh, presentation along with uh, some observations of my own. Well, there is no doubt that uh, sharing economy and uh, associated uh, two-sided uh, platforms actually, they have tremendous potential in promoting <coughs> public welfare. And uh, Professor Shirdar's paper has brought out, he has raised some pertinent issues regarding the regulatory ch challenges posed by this platform. These platforms are disrupting not just the markets, in fact, they are also challenging existing regulations and raising many legal issues all over the world. And key issue is how do governments and regulators keep up with the rapid disruptive innovation of these platforms? as India has many two-sided platforms in diverse products uh, markets, this issue is as uh, pertinent for India as at the global level. So what exactly is the challenge? I'm going to, actually my predecessors have discussed this issue more at, at a micro level. I'm going to take more of a macro view. So what exactly is the challenge? See, 
digital platforms call themselves technology intermediaries and they are only connecting producers and consumers and hence they are not they consider that they are not subject to regulations of the concerned markets on the other hand uh, affected incumbents of disrupted markets are accusing actually these disruptors of flouting market regulations and even of anti competitive behavior so this is the key issue the stand on two sides are very different uber is perhaps the best example of regulatory challenges posed by these platforms uber had in fact such a profound impact on taxi market all over the world that backlash now includes world over worldwide uh, protest fights and eventually government intervention regulators all over the world in fact are debating whether to you know allow to continue this uh, i mean service efficient service which citizens like or shut it down because uh, they are not following regulations or maybe they are challenging the existing order and so many other issues i agree with the the paper that due to lagging regulation these platforms are enjoying tremendous regulatory arbitrage for example in terms of tax burden and insurance uh, coverage etc platforms like uber and airbnb they do not play by the same rules as applicable to you know analog or traditional market players and uh, in a struggle for survival and market share actually these traditional play players are demanding better regulation of these disruptors and level playing field <coughs> in fact the very soon european court of justice will decide on whether uber is a transport company or digital platform in case the court decides that it is a uh, transport company then uber in europe will be subject to all the regulations applicable to this sector and that will raise their cost of operating in europe so this brings out the challenge of uh, you know challenges uh, <coughs> posed by these uh, platforms second issue raised in the paper relates to either low or nil liability of the digital platforms for example uber and bnb air bnb try to wash up their hands regarding liability for actions of their drivers and landlords respectively however this appears to be very unfair and against societal interest the paper rightly advocates mandatory compliance of regulations relating to public interest safety consumer protection social harmony etc for example rooms offered on airbnb and oyo should adhere to the fire safety standard just like all other hotels are expected to do well coming to the next issue this paper has recommended that the digital platforms require different rules compared to the traditional brick and mortar businesses in my view this is largely not correct one view is that the existing regulatory frameworks are not well suited to dealing with the existing models of the disrupting innovators alternative view is that after all <coughs> disruptive innovation is not a new phenomena markets have always been shaped by successive waves of disruption for so many years well i think entirely different rules are not really required to deal with digital uh, disruption but the existing ones maybe they may be supplemented uh, by some new rules wherever needed and updated and all as per the demands of the situation for example one particular area that comes to mind is now these platforms are collecting tremendous amount of uh, data personal data so there are serious issues relating to privacy and security of this data and definitely regulation on this issue is needed no doubt another issue relates to intervention by competition authorities all over the world these platforms are actually uh, facing action by uh, competition authorities although some people view that you know the dyn very fast rapid disruptive uh, nature of innovation in these platforms actually will not uh, allow you know this uh, compet sorry market power to be maintained for a long period but fact is all over the world competition authorities are intervening in these sectors to keep the markets open competitive and free for innovation why because the presumption is that peculiar characteristics of uh, these platforms actually increase the likelihood of that market power being maintained and its ab abuse over time now <coughs> critical question is what is the right way to force in competition law in these markets given that traditional economic analysis is not really by and large not applicable to this digital platform there are serious issues regarding market definition definition of market power etc and so many other complexities and one more thing the competition in these uh, 
uh, platforms is actually dynamic. Normally in competition analysis, we take the static view of competition. So how do competition authorities really, you know, check the anti-competitive behavior in these markets while they are trying to, you know, maintain the incentive to innovate? I believe that the, there is no need for really, you know, a different kind of uh, competition policy. The existing policy along with, uh, let's say, refined and innovative kinds of tools and techniques plus uh, taking the dynamic view of the competition. I think this, this type of competition policy can really provide answers to all these questions that I have posed. So these are just some of the challenges uh, that, that have been mentioned in Professor Shridhar's paper and uh, I have com commented on them. I feel these challenges actually, they suggest some kind of, uh, let's say, some, some kind of imperatives. Just two, three observations. One is that to confront challenges posed by the disruptive technologies, regulation should be fair, cautious, balanced, and timely without impeding innovation. Now, that last line is actually very, very important. Further, there can't be a blanket solution, you know. Uh, so regulatory solution should be tailored to specific circumstances. But now, just one minute. This is easier said than done, you know. To do this actually, as I think it was brought out by one of the earlier speakers, regulators, you know, they have to be very, very, they have to build up their capacity, they have to continuously update understanding of these new disruptive technologies, their effect on markets, consumer competition, but this itself is actually a very, very challenging task. Given the nature of these markets, it is not really easy to do that. Second point is, you know, now, as more and more companies are operating across multiple markets, regulation, regulators across different markets actually need to collaborate and find out what are the best practices, what works and not. And in many cases, this may actually also require collaborating across the border. For example, to you know, regulate anti-competitive measures in these platforms. And lastly, you know, we all know that the regulation and competition policy actually exists to help unlock economic value for consumers and society. And uh, regulators should be wary of simply protecting incumbency at the expense of realizing this value. Let me end by thanking Professor Shridhar for taking up a highly relevant topic, raising the right questions, and suggesting some good ideas for further thought and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, two discutants have uh, no to deliver their speech or their, their comment, and I give the floor to uh, Mr. Aja uh, from the, the U Yusuf Ishka Institute. Sorry, 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 sorry. National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. Thanks. Um, this is a very interesting uh, session. I just want to say that I am personally astonished at how all of us have shifted from uh, being uh, respectful, bordering on reverential, uh, towards the amazing things being done by technology companies, to a mood of being far more skeptical about uh, how these things work. It's fascinating how much uh, this thing has come. Um, I look forward to a place where all of us will treat uh, participation in social media as being like smoking, but we're not quite there. So <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's coming. Okay. Um, I think that uh, the old knowledge of public economics is a useful way to think about these questions. Uh, in classical public economics, we are taught that uh, there are four kinds of market failures. There is uh, market power, there is asymmetric information, there are externalities, and there are public goods. And these are the four things where the free market fumbles and makes mistakes. And somewhere in there you might find uh, a useful role for the government and uh, for state intervention. So in that sense, there's nothing new going on here. We just have to reinterpret these old timeless ideas in the new context. So in that sense, the crimes are old, the means through which crimes are committed is new. And in that sense, we can fall back on a lot of old knowledge and old jurisprudence and old understanding. So it is not all new. It is actually 
one more round of a story that's been going on for hundreds of years. When electricity came, people started getting electrocuted and government set up safety standards for plug points. Okay, so it's the oldest story in uh, the development of uh, state. Where I think this is more problematic and is more difficult is in the problem of state capacity. Uh, we are being faced with a unique level of complexity and uh, it is going to require considerable capability on the part of governments to do well in intervening. Okay? Governments also have failed many times all through history. Governments have fumbled and been inept and have interfered with human progress. So we've got to be very mindful of that. And what I think this situation calls for is a new level of capability, of expertise on the part of the state. That the fumbling, blunt, uh, crude, politicized, corrupt practices of government, which is a fair description of many parts of the world, is going to be a problem. So I think that's the story. The real story is not that uh, high technology has created a new set of problems. The real uh, story is that there is a confrontation between low state capabilities and uh, the questions that we face. Uh, what do I see happening here in India that is different from the global discourse? I think that there are three things that are interesting and different about India when compared to some other places. The first thing that is different about India is that uh, we are more like Europe and less like the United States and less like China in the sense that uh, we have no technology giants who are effective in the Indian political system. Okay, so in the United States, uh, firms like Facebook are extremely powerful in the domestic political discourse. In China, the children and sons-in-law of uh, politicians are running important internet and technology companies. The nice thing about India is that neither of these two apply. The children and sons-in-law of Indian politicians are not running technology companies. And the American uh, technology giants are not very effective in this political landscape. So I think that gives us a better place in terms of being able to grapple with these situations. And in that sense, the political economy here is closer to what we see in Europe and less like what we see either in America or in China. The second thing uh, that I see is that we have an even greater problem of low state capacity. So if everywhere in the world, governments are grappling to come to terms with this situation, then we in India are even worse. We have a very big problem in terms of state capacity. Uh, um, here are a couple of examples. Uh, we talk about the problem of privacy. Uh, as of today, we, are, we have not even begun on the question of privacy. We've got a spectacular Supreme Court ruling two months ago, and uh, we're still at the early stages of figuring out how that will translate into protections for private persons and protections against the state, protections against technology companies. So we're at the very early stages of figuring out privacy, and I'm thrilled and excited by that Supreme Court judgment, but I have to say it caught me by surprise. It could easily have been worse than that. So we are in a low state capacity environment where these things cannot be taken for granted. A second example of uh, state capacity is in our competition law. We are in an early stage of building competition regulation. Uh, we have two important cases in this field, one about uh, the NSC case on a on currency derivatives trading and another on taxi cabs and my personal view is on both of them the competition authority got it wrong they failed to understand the complexities of what they were up against the third example is uh, in sheer blatant outright violation of law okay so all of us have horror stories about uber but when i watched the story unfold in india i, I thought the violations were particularly blatant i mean there was just there was a black and white gap between what was the de jure state of law and there was a corporation who was just completely violating those laws. And it again brings you to questions of state capacity. Where was the enforcement? What was the judiciary doing? These kinds of questions. I think we suffer from these problems even more.
the third point I would like to make is about free riding. Okay, so hypothetically, uh, you may think that suppose a bunch of uh, European uh, regulators and judges come up with new doctrine that makes a significant difference to how Facebook and Twitter and Uber operate. Is it directly the implication that we here in India will automatically benefit from this? I wish to say absolutely not because nothing prevents a corporation from running different versions of its code in different geographies. So just because a certain version of Twitter runs in France, it doesn't mean that Twitter here is any safer. We're going to do our, have to do our own heavy lifting. So for a contrast, India is able to free ride on the United States FDA on drug approvals. India is able to free ride on the European processes of drug approvals. Once you know that drug X is safe when attacking disease Y, that's knowledge that ports across boundaries. That will absolutely not apply here because nothing prevents a corporation from d running a different version of the code. And Twitter can be as toxic as it used to be here, even if rules change um, elsewhere in the world. Um, finally, uh, what is the way forward? There are no easy ways forward, but I have one opinion on what could be important. I think we need a lot more product liability here. I think there is an old doctrine of product liability that if you buy a washing machine and the washing machine does harm to the person living in the house where the washing machine is operating, then there should be liabilities upon the maker of the washing machine. I think this simple idea will take us very far. When the software delivered gadgets go into my bedroom and do harm to me, then we should be attaching product liability on the people who do that. I think this simple idea will take us very far. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the last one uh, to take the floor on that is Mr. James Mancini, uh, analyst in competition division in the OECD. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's a, a tough uh, set of uh, comments to follow. I think it's been very interesting so far. Uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit of, of repetitive, I should uh, thank Cuts very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I know that the OECD is very proud of its uh, partnership with Cuts, and I think that events like this and great discussions like this are, are a very good example of why. Um, I should also note that my views are, are mine and mine alone and don't necessarily reflect the, uh, the views of the OECD or its member countries. Uh, and uh, thank you for, to Professor Ireland for uh, the chance to take a look at the, at the paper. Um, I think that it was a, a really interesting uh, compilation of, of the types of issues. Uh, it's very uh, broad in scope, and uh, I think in particular the, the appendix that you had uh, is kind of an inventory of all of the aspects of, of digital markets that, that can be a little bit challenging. So that was, uh, that was great, and I think that the wicked problem framework is, is, a, is a novel way of, of looking at things. Um, so as I read it, and actually over the course of this discussion, I've, I've, I've come up with uh, three points that, that I'd like to uh, elaborate a little bit on um, and explore a little bit, and maybe you know, we'll find some, some differences of opinion as well. Uh, the first is on the nature of issues that we're facing in digital markets. Uh, the second is on the capacity of regulators to respond. And the third is really, you know, what are the steps that regulators should look at taking to, uh, to revise the regulatory frameworks in light of, of, uh, of all of these digital changes? So the first comment, and I think I would maybe differ slightly with uh, Professor Shaw on this, um, I think that it's important to keep an open mind whenever we're looking at, at, at digital uh, change. I think that in some ways the zeitgeist has almost flipped 180 degrees to, be com to being completely deferential of technology companies to now talking about all of the ills. And I think that the overall tone of many of the discussions that we have nowadays, you know, we use words like, uh, you know, disruption, which might have a, you know, negative connotation, chaos, and crowding, which, which uh, I'm going to elaborate a little bit uh, further in a minute. But I think that it's important to uh, come back to the, to the core principle, which comes from um, uh, Clayton Christensen. He came up with this term that's often been abused uh, of disruptive innovation. 
And the idea is that a disruptive innovation is something that comes in at the low end of the market, and it's something that seeks to uh, cut out middlemen. So oftentimes it, it lowers prices for consumers, this is the broader idea. It can overcome you know, barriers to entry, including regulatory barriers to entry, and I think that's the, you know, a lot of the source of the problems that we're uh, dealing with today. And it can uh, significantly improve uh, accessibility of services in, in the ideal world. And so uh, I think it's a particularly relevant type of technology issue to consider in, in LDCs. Um, and I mean, I, that's not to say that uh, there aren't some really significant policy challenges, and I know that, uh, you, you know, a, a perfect example uh, was a study that I was reviewing uh, recently by the FTC on data brokers. So the idea is the data brokers can scrape information from your online presence from a variety of different places, whether it's social media accounts or, or even payment records, and what they can do is actually reconstruct a profile of you, and that can be used for a variety of risk management tools. So it can be used for credit applications, it can be used for jobs, applications, uh, background checks, things like that. So on the one hand, obviously this creates really significant uh, privacy concerns, uh, particularly because consumers are generally not very aware of the fact that their information is going to be used for this purpose. But on the flip side, it can actually have a lot of promise. And we've seen a few companies in South America that are, that are coming up with using these methods with the awareness and, and consent of consumers to be able to uh, construct alternative credit scores. So this is a way of actually improving access to financial systems for people that may not have bank accounts and, and have a hard time kind of building up a traditional credit rating. So, th so there's, a, there's a lot of you know, positive uh, promise, and I think that it's important for regulators to come at this issue, not viewing it as a problem to be solved, but as, as something to think about. And so with that in mind, um, I thought of a couple of the descriptors that uh, Professor Ireland uh, used when we're talking about these digital innovations. Um, and, and I think that uh, it's important to remember that it, it depends on a case-by-case -case basis. So for example, if we're talking about uh, markets becoming more and more crowded uh, because of uh, digital entrance, I think that from a competition perspective, and this is a, you know, a big concern of ours, uh, there's a lot of cases where the problem is the opposite, that markets aren't crowded enough. And so because of really significant network effects, uh, high economies of scale, you have these uh, concerns uh, where uh, you may have competition for the market. So this kind of tipping point where a single large dominant firm, and I won't name any names, but I'm sure we can all come up with a couple, uh, a single large dominant firm can, can play an outsized role. And so in this case, it's not a question of crowding or not crowding, it's really a question of whether that uh, market is contestable and whether the dominance uh, of that player is, is, is being used uh, to, to distort competition and, and prevent entry by other, by other uh, market participants. And the other uh, word that I thought was interesting was the word chaos. Uh, because again, there's competition concerns that actually markets are not chaotic enough. That because of algorithms uh, and the high degree of transparency of prices, uh, it's allowing actually some firms, particularly in highly concentrated markets, to live a nice, quiet life where they can have this tacitly collusive outcome that doesn't require them to, to, to be chaotic. And I think that uh, part of the initial promise of this disruptive innovation is to inject an element of chaos into the markets, which is a really positive thing from a competition point of view, even if it can you know, create some significant challenges for regulators. And I think that at the end of the day, so I've talked a little bit about chaos, I've talked a little bit about crowding, and this has been touched on several times today, a lot of these issues are not really new. Maybe the degree of speed with which they're evolving is new, maybe the combination of issues that we're dealing with at a, at a single time um, is new, but on balance they're not new. And so that brings me to my second point, which is, uh, you know, are, are regulators uh, ready and are they fit for purpose? And I think that it's, it's clear that we can talk all day about the various you know, challenges that regulators face, but I actually have a pretty optimistic perspective on it. Uh, if you're a sector regulator, for example, I think that this is a great opportunity for you to actually look at modernizing and adapting your regulation. There may be things that you've known about for a long time that you would love to change, and, and this is a great opportunity to do it. Uh, and if you're a competition authority, I think it's important to not only be conscious about 
you know, using your tools. Uh, but it's a great way to come back to first principles. So the thing that we keep on hearing over and over again uh, at the OECD, and, and we had a great discussion on two-sided markets, for example, recently, the idea is that you shouldn't throw out all of your old analytical tools, uh, that in fact there are a lot of really practical adaptations that you can make, and so you don't have to start from square one. And even if you can't use you know, a, an established model or a quantitative method, there are definitely ways that you can at least use those methods as an as a, uh, underlying inspiration for thinking about a framework for thinking about a problem when you're, when you're analyzing it. So really important to, to just not, not throw everything out. Um, now, one thing that uh, Professor Ireland did uh, underline, uh, okay, I, sh I should speed up. Uh, one thing that Professor Ireland did uh, underline, which I think is a, is a really great point, is the idea that uh, we shouldn't simply be regulating for the sake of regulating, doing something just, just to respond. So there's a need to, in particular, be able to show in a persuasive way that there's harm in a market and, uh, and, and that uh, we have a, a, a mechanism for doing something about it. And so this brings to my final, me to my final point, um, because I really wanted to actually come out uh, with a little bit of an action item or, or something that regulators could do, because I think a lot of these forum, there tends to be a lot of shrugging and hand-waving and no one really knows what to do. And so, as I said, uh, I think that a lot of regulators can use this kind of disruption as an opportunity. Um, we, there's a lot of tools out there to help you uh, conduct an analysis of your regulation, and if you'll forgive the shameless plug, the OECD has a competition assessment toolkit, for example which allows you to take an inventory of, of the regulations in your sector. You can consider the impact on competition. You can cons consider alternatives, consider whether these regulations are even uh, needed. So for example, we've done a, a study of the legal services market. And in a lot of cases there, the underlying market failures that Professor uh, Shaw was discussing uh, are actually partially being addressed by technology or they're being addressed in a different way by technology. So there's a need to kind of change the, uh, the approach. And the underlying concept here is really, it's very important to understand why you have the regulation there in the first place, what it's supposed to address, whether those problems still exist, whether there are new problems, and then try and, try and respond accordingly. And uh, the, maybe the final point I would uh, make is to emphasize the behavioral uh, aspect. I know that that's a very uh, vogue uh, subject in economics, but there are, again, some really practical tools out there. I think the UK Competition and Markets Authority is a, is a great uh, leader in this area. They've uh, engaged in quite a few studies in cooperation with sector regulators, and they have really practical insights because traditionally a lot of the you know, standard approach to dealing with some regulatory issues, especially if you're a competition authority, you want to allow competition to do your work. So you're really focused on improving consumer information. That's always been a, a big focus. But what we're finding is that even sometimes when consumers have the information, even if you have a document that gets distributed door to door saying you will earn uh, X extra dollars by changing banks, people tend to exert a high degree of inertia. Uh, I'm just finishing up. People tend to uh, exhibit a really high degree of inertia, and there's a lot of behavioral biases. So there's a lot of ways that uh, regulators can come up with uh, novel approaches that really reflect uh, the behavioral economics insights that are that are starting to come out. Um, some of those include kind of leveraging social pressures, and uh, and so I will leave it to that. Just uh, I guess my my uh, final message would be: don't lose hope too much. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Thank you. So it's time now to you to react to to, to uh, uh, ask some question. Uh, so we have uh, more or less uh, 20 minutes to do that. So. Uh, be short, precise, remark or question. I give you, yes, oh. I give you the floor. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my question is to Professor uh, Sridhar. I haven't read your paper, right? But if you talk about uh, the role for competition law, what do we do now? Like, uh, should we give them just like a window period uh, to gain critical mass, but I believe the question of critical mass comes when already there is a player and this person, this, this new entrant who is trying to gain critical mass is trying to eat into the market share, right, to gain the network effects. But if we give the window uh, period, uh, no competition like a regulatory holiday, it would be difficult to control it later on because the consumers might get locked in because of the network effects. So what is it that you suggest or should we assign the role to regulatory authorities the way the Indian FDI in e-commerce did, like, you know, 
the platform owner in no way would influence the prices of the product on the platform. What's your take on it? Okay, I, I take two other questions and then I, I, I come back to the, the yes, the second one. It was there? Yeah. 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 So my question to the panel, excluding perhaps to James, who, with whom I agree uh, to a considerable degree, is uh, to get the views on the following proposition. Uh, to the standard, uh, you know, uh, theory that government regulation is premised on market failures, should we not have an intermediate question whether government regulation uh, necessarily makes things better off relative to the status quo? And if the answer to that is negative, then perhaps you know, being the constraint, being in the constrained universe that we are, uh, uh, we best wait for technological evolution to sort of uh, take us out to a better equilibrium than, the, than, than you know, uh, chase, chase our tails, uh, empowering the regulators, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, again, given the political economy is a very difficult, uh, 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 you know, uh, quest. Thank you. Okay, you don't say uh, to you to who you you ask your question, to but the, to uh, the whole panel, to the, to the panel excluding perhaps James. Okay, yeah. and the third question, who wants the floor? At this stage, nobody is important for the platform, and uh, one of the ways is to discount, and uh, one of the ways is to treat one side as subsidy side, and therefore the regulation are not, uh, in, you know, regulation which info which. Uh, you know, enforces platform providers not to influence the price is not going to work because they have to influence the price in order to gain the critical mass because one side has to be subsidized in some way or the other. So, um, the uh, one of the uh, uh, possible regulatory response could be that uh, uh, you, uh, you know, allow, for example, um, discounted pricing or capital dumping uh, to, uh, uh, you know, go on for some time and, and if, the regulator thinks that uh, the exponential phase of growth uh, started happening, uh, then put a bar on it. I mean, it, I know that you know critical mass for each of these sectors could be very different, and it is not known even to the platform service provider. So it's a difficult question, but uh, I think that we providing a window for uh, an incumbent to attain a critical mass may not be a bad idea. Okay. That point that can be a sliding window. Okay, thank you. Who wants to to answer to the second question in the panel? You so you need to first do no harm if you're trying to respond. But I think it's also important to take a step backward and to think uh, to what degree does the regulation that is currently there already kind of define the market? So is it uh, does it specify a technology? Does it specify a specific business model? In that case, maybe there is a case for you know changing regulation to make sure that you're you've opened up um, in a way that's not going to un undermine the original purposes of the regulation. Thank you. Other question or remarks? Yes, there. So, good evening. My name is Amol Kulkarni. Uh, when we are talking about regulatory responses to such disruptive sectors, uh, while I noticed that one of the panelists have talked about uh, using tools such as competition impact assessment, uh, do you think that uh, that could be partially successful and we should uh, have a little bit broad-based approach. There are tools like regulatory impact assessment which uh, advocate for ex ante uh, as estimating possible uh, impacts of regulation and uh, adopting such regulatory alternative which has potential to result in maximum net, net benefit. There are also tools like regulatory sandbox which allow uh, ex experimenting with these uh, with these disruptive technologies for a limited period through which regulators can build their capacity and uh, come out with a better regulation. Uh, I would request the panel to share their thoughts on uh, experiences with these tools and would these tools be useful for uh, low capacity regulators in countries like India. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, if there was no other question, to the whole panel, what about the issue of cross subsidies when you're looking at market and disruption, right? Obviously, uh, these disruptors don't necessarily have to be the new shining, you know, startup. It could be well yield, well funded, extremely powerful companies that have a dominant share in another market, but use that to obviously enter into another market. And then the question becomes, 
what do you look at in terms of the definition, in terms of standard competition uh, parlance of saying, is this, uh, in a sense, uh, disruptive from a predatory pricing perspective, dominant share perspective, those questions, how would they be answered in that context? Okay, and the last one. Uh, in the yes, uh, I am Shivashish Gupta from IIM Bangalore, and this uh, question or comment is directed to Professor Ajay Shah. Uh, Professor Shah talked about uh, essentially what may be called the public interest theory of regulation. That is, there are market failures of different types, and therefore the government responds uh, by providing the appropriate regulation. Sometimes it's also called the normative as positive theory of regulation in the sense something ought to be done, so therefore it is done. But there's another theory of regulation which is sometimes called the economic theory of regulation which suggests that, uh, that regulation like any other good responds to the laws of demand and supply. Regulation is demanded by industries and it is supplied by the government and so consequently the kind of regulation that you get uh, is determined more by industry interests rather than um, responding to the, to the needs of the public. I would suspect that the you know, I've been laws around IP regulation, etc., intellectual property regulation seems to be more of a case of that. So there are different opinions as to, you know, in certain industries, one theory seems to operate, in certain others, it, it seems the economic theory of regulation is more prevalent. So why, if at all, I don't know if you believe in this, but why do you think that this ICT markets and this particular sector would be more uh, amenable to, say, the public interest theory of, uh, of regulation? Okay, so I will give very shortly the floor to the panelists, and then I will ask to Mr. A I think that we all today will understand that uh, regulation is uh, inevitably uh, in, uh, imperfect and controversial. So if we th when we think about uh, optimal regulation, uh, optimal regulation is a regulation that is accepted to be, uh, that its uh, cost is a, uh, we, we minimize the cost of inefficiency and the, uh, the cost of controversy, and the thinking and the thinking of uh, optimal regulation in the, sense, in the theoretical sense doesn't make a lot of sense actually. So uh, uh, when we are going about the design, one of the major focus, one of the major uh, issues is how to reduce the cost of controversy in terms of uh, legal uh, legal litigation or legal challenges and also the, in the potential inefficiencies. So that's, I think, address, address two of the questions here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I completely agree with the direction that you're going in. Um, public choice theory teaches us that uh, politicians and officials are self-interested. It is important for us to put on a whiteboard and uh, a starry-eyed and optimistic view of the world. And then it is important for us to be practical and realistic that state capacity constraints will interfere. I just lump all this under state capacity, that competence, incorruptibility, this is what is state capacity. And I worry that we in India will often come up short. Yeah, I mean, on the question of big companies cross-subsidizing uh, in another market, um, I think there's no problem with that uh, because in, in many cases, if you have network effects, this cross-subsidizing is building a sort of like a demand for the particular product. Uh, in, but having said that, um, this point about behavioral uh, psychology and economics, it's, it's really important um, because by cross-subsidizing, cross, cross uh, it could change consumer behavior uh, in, a, in a sense that, um, that it, 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 in a not very good way. Uh, for example, in uh, ride-sharing, right? The over-dependence of consumer on particular modes of transport can change uh, because of this cross-subsidizing. But 
Um, then there's also a similar example of maybe infrastructure uh, in the case of uh, e-commerce and in countries where there is a lack of infrastructure uh, to, to, to support that e-commerce. Uh, some of the companies have gone on to uh, heavily invest in infrastructure and logistics to, to make sure that their business model kind of work. Um, that would give you a sort of like a different uh, issue than a developed country which have a developed logistics system. So I think it's important to look at country by country. Someone mentioned about uh, developing and developed country differences. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ireland, do you want to comment? Huh? The And, and I give you, it's possible, fi maximum five minutes, if you can. <laughs> I, I think I could be even shorter. First off, I thought the comments of all of you, including those that were not directed directly at my paper, were very, very helpful. I love the comment about disruptive technologies not being, uh, and not being properly defined. Uh, from my experience with disruptive technologies, it's all in the eye of the beholder. For me, for me, these technologies work great because they provide me with opportunities. But if I lost my job or my business, I would call it disruptive. And I think I saw the same thing in biotechnology. Farmers love biotechnology. It's the ethical concerns, the religious concerns that cause, ca cause problems. The second point, I'd like to go back to James, and I really appreciate the fact that you actually read the whole paper. I w <laughs> that came as a, uh, as a very pleasant shock. And I just want to reiterate a very, <laughs> a very good point you made, is that this all looks very new, but going back to your basic criteria, I think is a good place to start. And we've been talking about this fully for that last two days, as a matter of fact. Two basic criteria for regulatory intervention, competition or whatever. Is there evidence of regulatory harm, anti-competitive effects, consumer harm, consumer detriment? And does it look as though those effects are substantial and not likely to change in the future through normal market forces. And I think when I, when I go to developing countries to talk about competition law and regulation, that's what I always insist on. If you don't see a problem, don't try to make it up. It's not theoretical. The theory, doesn't, the theory helps you in your analysis, but it doesn't help you to come to a judgment. There's got to be real harm out there before you act, because otherwise you could be getting into a type one error and setting up a regulation that chills competition and chills innovation. So that's my final comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, uh, yes, an applause for <laughs> you, the, such a dynamic and, and, and vibrant discussion. But uh, if, I, if I can, because it's in my position, I can, so I try. Uh, of course, I think that uh, whatever we will do, what about regulation of this uh, new, se new sector? Is it new or not? That's, that was a question. Eh? And maybe it's more capitalism, the platform, as really a new sector, because of course that's the same question and the same uh, problems, uh, even if it's by viola violation of the rules that some big companies took place uh, as Uber. I'm surprised that we spoke especially about Uber and Airbnb, but not, not so much about the small, small startups uh, starting to, to work with platforms that are differently as the, bigger, the big one. That's another question. But if we, ha we have to uh, uh, regulate, I think that uh, uh, I, I, the word as liability, relevancy, uh, a process, and maybe not rules decide, decided one day, but of course a process of decision, a capacity to decide, it means that it's, uh, it requests also in the state and government spaces more competencies or more uh, uh, um, skills to, 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 to do that, uh, and maybe also to go back to the fundament uh, of economy in order to, uh, to, to avoid to lose you, you head or lose your ideas because we are in a new sector. No, maybe we need the same base adapted or re reinterpreted, as you said. So I think that there's a lot of things to do, uh, and I hope that in your uh, capacities you will try to use uh, all what was said today uh, to go further uh, in the state, in the civil society, in the economic sector, uh, in the competition competition uh, 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 bodies that you are you have in charge. So I thank the panelists and I thank the two the, the two authors of the papers because it was really useful. There was many many. Uh, uh, description, even if we not have the solution, uh, we are a little bit further as we started. So thank you for that.